right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Another one of uh, Uphill Pursuits Backcountry 101 nights. Um, we've got Ben Zavora from Beartooth Powder Guides with us tonight. He's going to take over here in just a minute and talk through some uh, avalanche safety stuff, some route finding stuff. Pretty excited to to get to work with him. He can tell you all about his uh, business and organization and what they do and has a lot of good info for you all tonight. So again, thanks for joining. Uh, I wish we could be doing these in person, but I think the way the winter is shaping up currently, we'll probably be hosting virtual 101s for most of the winter. Uh, we're in the process right now of working with the health department and Mount Ellis Academy to actually make the Schemo race series happen this winter. Um, so stay tuned for that. We've putting together a whole COVID health plan and doing uh, some work with Mount Ellis Academy. So we'll keep everybody posted as to what happens there and what that looks like. Otherwise, uh, yeah, winter's somewhere. I think it's in Cook City right now. It's not necessarily in the mountains here. It snowed a little bit, but uh, shop's up and running. You need anything, come on in. We got some sales going on with Black Friday and all that rigmarole. Um, Pretty caught up on shop work in the back shop too. So if you need some mount stone or a tune or a skins cut or anything before the season comes, uh, stop on in, drop your gear off. We can get that. Uh, we've got a couple more 101s coming up. We're actually doing an ice climbing 101 and a storytelling night on uh, December 3rd, which is the first Thursday in December. And then we actually have uh, our own Becky Switzer is going to be doing another kind of backcountry 101 with a couple of her friends and uh, focusing really designed for the women out there. Um, and so that one is gonna be on the 17th of December as well. So got all that stuff going. So a couple of housekeeping things, uh, just make sure your camera's off, bandwidth stuff, and just make sure you're muted as well. Uh, that way Ben's got all the bandwidth he needs to do everything he, he wants to. And uh, in regards to questions, Ben's gonna kind of fire through his whole presentation and do his stuff. and. Uh, the chat box that you can find up in the upper right corner. If you've got questions for Ben throughout the presentation, just go ahead and type that question in right there. Uh, Ben's gonna take some time at the very end to go through and answer all those questions for everybody. So, cool. Uh, yeah, we the whole goal of this is bring community together, kind of giving a chance for our local guides and businesses and organizations to talk about themselves and to share some knowledge with everybody. So. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Zavora of uh, Beartooth Powder Guide. So, Ben, it's uh, it's all your show. So go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate having me. And um, yeah, thank you all for showing up to listen to my talk about using your basic avalanche skills for route finding and terrain terrain management. Um, basically, you know this this uh, talk I'm about to do. It's I put it together to try to help folks that already have some kind of basic avalanche skills, backcountry skiing, snowboarding, traveling skills, and to um, kind of give you guys some like tips and tricks to like simplify the process and make it a more enjoyable experience for you out there, a safer experience. Um, I find a lot of folks that end up taking avalanche classes uh, all across the, around, the, you know, around the board, or around the country. Um, they come away scared and, and not feeling comfortable in the backcountry. And, um, you know, I just, I think that it's, people should be able to go out in the backcountry and have a good time, even if you're just a beginner, using some basic things um, to stay safe and some conservative decision-making um, processes that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so to give you a little background on myself, uh, my name is Ben Zavora, and I lived in Bozeman for about 14 years. I've been down here in Cook City. This will be my 10th year uh, down here. Um, I'm an AMGA certified ski guide, and I just love backcountry skiing. Um, I like the education portion of it as well, so we do a lot of education, avalanche classes and such around here. Um, we have a guiding company with a couple huts, and if you guys aren't familiar with Cook City, um, it's basically uh, the center, uh, central southern part of the state, and our back door is Wyoming, so we do a lot of skiing in Wyoming in the Shoshone uh, wilderness. Um, so. Uh, we got a pretty unique area here because we're right next to the northeast entrance to Yellowstone Park. We're in the uh, right next to the, for, uh, the Forest Service for the Custer Gallatin National Forest and also the Shoshone. And it's a one way in, one way out community in the wintertime. Uh, the road's only plowed from Gardner. So it's pretty unique. Uh, here's one of our classic Cook City um, Main Street sunsets. Um, pretty fortunate to live here um, and it's a pretty unique place. So if you haven't visited, it's definitely worth checking out. 
Um, we are blessed with snow around here. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, in the last 10 seasons that I've been hanging out here, we've had uh, above normal and three near record seasons of snowfall. We're off to a banner start this year um, and already have like four to five feet of a settled base at mid elevations, um, you know, like 9,000 feet plus. Um, so skiing has been quite good. Uh, this is a picture of some of the skiing we do south of town uh, with our iconic pilot index peaks in the background. And then we also ski a lot in north of town in the Beartooth proper. This is a grasshopper glacier. We do some skiing there from the yurt. Um, and then Beartooth Powder University, it's kind of my idea behind it was uh, when I when I started backcountry skiing about 24 years ago, 25 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of formal education available for folks out there to be safe. And um, so it's kind of trial by fire. So when I started this business in 2011, one of the, the main things I wanted to do is like to educate folks and give them an avenue to uh, try to get out in the backcountry and um, be safer right from the get go and get some like good formal education. And it's interesting the dynamics of this industry, how it's changed since I started doing this stuff. Um, basically, you know, we've been trying to tell folks you got to take avalanche classes and it's been like kind of a hard sell to a certain point. But whatever happened in the last couple of years, especially with this COVID thing, everyone wants to get into avalanche classes. And so lots of people are taking them, uh, which is good for business. And it's good to see that people want to get a good baseline before going out in the backcountry. So when we're out in the backcountry, we get ready to go out in the backcountry. What I'm going to go through tonight is um, just what we do, like the steps that we do as professionals and recreationalists to prepare to go out in the mountains and just some tips and tricks we use to stay safe. And like I said before, a lot of people get scared of going in the backcountry because if they think it's a lot of voodoo science and things like that. And I think that you can really simplify the process and we're going to try to do that for you a little bit tonight. And uh, there'll probably be some questions if I had to guess. And so I'll just, you know, end up answering those all at the end. We fill out a field book every day and do some forms before we leave to go out in the mountains. Um, but we're always looking for some critical factors before we even step out of the door. You know, over coffee in the morning, me or my guides or, you know, anyone um, working for me is, is going through these same kind of motions. And uh, some of those things is we're going to look at the avalanche danger rating, right? We're going to go to the Avalanche Center website mtavalanche.com in Montana, in Southwest Montana, um, we're going to get a danger rating. Um, you know, first things we're going to do is get the danger rating. We're going to look at the, what the wind's been doing in the last 24 hours and what's forecasted for the future. Um, these are some pretty basic things. Um, we're going to uh, look at uh, how much new snow we've got in the last 24 hours and uh, how much is forecasted uh, for our day out in the mountains because things can change pretty quickly. You might leave and there's really not a big loading event, but you know, with two inches an hour for five hours, you could have a significant loading event and all of a sudden your avalanche danger is gonna change pretty quickly. Um, and then we're gonna to try to figure out what's our number one concern out there. Like what's our number one avalanche hazard that we're worried about? And then we're gonna look for a secondary avalanche hazard. What's that? And the reason we're looking for these things and I'll get into it more as I go through this PowerPoint is we're looking for what type of hazards we're looking for out there. We're going to correlate the terrain that we want to ski and travel in that day with those with those hazards because each type of avalanche concern has its own nuances. Um, and then uh, we're going to use some resources when we're um, doing our, our morning uh, rituals of checking things out. And I think it's really important for folks, if you're going to be a backcountry skier or snowboarder or snowmobiler, you just get in the habit, you know, throughout the season of making the time to follow the avalanche centers forecast, because if you can stay on top of things from the beginning of the season, you can track different problems and how they heal and change throughout the ceiling season. So that when you have that time to go out and play, you're not trying to catch up on a whole season's worth of snow information. Um, one of the resources I like to show to folks is uh, avalanche.org. And so the American Avalanche Association, um, is uh, is the governing body in the United States for all of our avalanche education and the forecast centers and the National Avalanche Center as well as part of that. And if you go to the avalanche.org, there's some really cool stuff that's really good information for you guys to use. Um, if you're traveling, it, the homepage comes up with a screen that you can see that here that basically has got all the different forecast areas and it's got the, the color in those forecast areas uh, is related to what is the actual forecast right now. So as you can see right here in the Colorado region, we're looking at, uh, you know, some green light um, or 
some green light conditions or low hazard, whereas up here in Wyoming at uh, in Jackson, the Bridger Tetons, we're looking at um, uh, moderate. What's nice about this is if you're going to Jackson for the weekend and you want to know what's going on there, you can click on this. It'll give you a brief overview. And then also you can click on the forecast and you can uh, get the forecast. So a really quick, easy way to see what's going on around the planet, or if you're just curious where you want to go travel and do some skiing, um, this is a good tool to see who's got more stable snow and who has more of it. Um, and some one other thing, you can check out all kinds of stuff on here, but one of the things I really like about this website, they've done a really good job, is if you take the Avalanche ba Basics, um, you can scroll down here and you can see there's some videos and things for learning. There's some information on how courses progress throughout the United States. There's a split now. There's recreational and pro avalanche classes. Uh, you can find providers. And then this is my, my favorite tool on the website. It's the Avalanche Encyclopedia. And it looks like it doesn't link from there, but I know it does from here. So we can go over here and you can see with the Avalanche Encyclopedia, you can search um, all kinds of terms. So if Doug Chabot in the morning is talking about some term in Avalanche world that you don't quite understand and you're a little confused or your buddy was talking about it, you can go over here and you can type in, you know, uh, we can type in wind slab, right? Um, there's a wind slab there and then we can learn more about that wind slab and what it is and even have a nice little video about it. So this is a really nice tool uh, to use, um, avalanche.org. And Canada has a very similar um, site where you can go in if you're traveling to Canada and, and access a lot of those other places as well, a lot of the, um, those places. Um, so then you've got your local forecast. Most of you guys probably are here hanging out in the Bozeman region or are already checking out this website on a regular basis. Um, you might be pretty familiar with it. They'll put you on an email list, so you just get the forecast every day. I highly recommend that. That's the best way to keep up with it. You can send them a note. I think they have a little button on here um, somewhere on this homepage where you can actually click it and uh, you can subscribe right there. But, you know, the way they format this stuff, it's got lots of videos and information. But um, in addition to that, one of the cool features they've had in the last few years is um, you can go to the region that you're going to ski here or snowmobile or snowboard at the top of the page and you can click it and then it'll give you more pertinent information for that reason, region. Um, so this is what we use a lot here in Cook City. We'll go to this page and they've got a description of the bottom line, uh, kind of a, what's going on, some videos, and then some really important stuff, which I'll get into more in the next, in, a, um, in another uh, slide is, it's got links to the weather stations up here uh, for snow and wind. It's got a cumulative snowfall, wind kind of stats there. So you can just say a quick glance, see what's been going on. Gusts up to 33 today from the Southwest. Um, and then you can come down here, you can look at the previous history. They haven't been doing a forecast yet, so there's no history, but you can see the trends um, and then I'll talk about this later, but our number one indicator for making decisions in the backcountry is recent avalanche activity. So whether you're, you know, out in the backcountry, you see an avalanche or someone else does, um, report it to the avalanche center. Then they can put it here on the website and you can um, see what was going on and find out more information about it. It's a really nice tool. Um, there's also pictures people send in from this region that you can check out there. And then if you want to get a little more techie about it, you can come down here and people have sub submitted uh, snow profiles. Uh, if you understand how those things read, you can check that out and learn more about the, the snow, the, the, what's going on under your feet without digging a hole, which is a really nice way to go. Um, so that is your mtavalanche.com. Subscribe, subscribe to it if you don't already. Um, and they'll start for daily forecasts here pretty quick, if I had to guess. Um, then kind of moving along, uh, getting into the weather stations and the snow tells. I'm just going to show you an example here of Fisher Creek. Um, this, is, this is just the morning ritual that I'm doing every day when I uh, go out in the mountains. And even I'm not going because I want to know what's going on. Um, is if you look here, you've got the dates and they have this thing simplified from the actual snow tell site. Um, and so 
it works in chronological order, which is nice because the actual Snowtail sites go backwards for some reason. Uh, but this is going to give you the hourly uh, snow water equivalent, snow depth, precipita precipitation accumulation, and the air temperature. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with the term snow water equivalent or SWE, that's really the most important thing. It's really nice to talk about the depth because everyone knows, you know, it's fun to ski deeper snow. But the truth of the matter is what's really important for your decision making process and going out in the backcountry is the snow water equivalent because that's the water, that's the, the density, the weight of that snow that's falling on the ground. So the heavier the snow, the more water content, it's going to be a more of an impact and it's going to change the, the avalanche conditions the most. And you can see in Cook City we're winning. Uh, just like in the last 24 hours here, we've picked up an inch of sweet. And that's only equating to inch of sweet looks like they're showing only, oh, you know, five, six inches. But it's, it's skiing quite good. It's denser snow. It's the kind of snow you want to see to build a nice base this time of year. Pretty unusual, really. You can also see the trends for the temperatures. And I think something that's really important, and we'll get into a little bit more here in a few minutes, but the temperatures are so important, especially when we get into the springtime, because if things aren't freezing up, uh, you can have some really catastrophic avalanches um, and so not when you the, especially when the avalanche center closes in the springtime one way you can be safe in the mountains is by checking to make sure it's at least freezing up at night once it starts not freezing at night for multiple days in a row you start having really big avalanches released typically so these are a good tool this is a good tool to use um, for that and then another tool uh, that i like to use quite a bit now, there's a couple different weather sources um, you guys are probably are familiar with this or maybe not, but these are the two that I'm constantly on all the time. And I got apps on my phone for them and I'm always tweaking out, checking things. Um, NOAA is kind of like the go-to site a lot of folks use. And there's actually a link to the NOAA uh, page on the Av Avalanche Center site. If you go to your specific region, they'll have a link to it, which is pretty slick. Um, you probably are familiar with this, but one of the couple of the tools that I use within this site, rather than just looking at the pictures and reading the description, is I'll use um, this uh, here, this map. And what's really nice about this map, let's just say we want to check out something in Cook City, and we want to find out a little bit more specific to the region that we're going to be in that day, um, rather than just a general like Cook City forecast because you know Cook City is at 7,600 feet we ski up to like 12,000 feet here so things are going to change quite a bit between town and way out in the mountains so I'll zoom in on my map and then you can find kind of where you want to check out and uh, you know you can scroll out and let's just say we go out here by Arrow Lakes which is at 10,000 feet you can click that and then it's going to give you an updated forecast for that region, taking into consideration the elevation change um, and the location. So that's one of the tools that I like to use a lot. And you can see it's changed. I mean, the temperatures are significantly colder up there, probably windier if I had to guess. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, my second favorite part of this website, there's all kinds of things you can use over here, is this graph. And I use this graph a lot when I'm trying to time bigger objectives um, ski mountaineering stuff or just good ski conditions or visibility. Um, springtime comes into play a lot is this graph and you can click on the graph here and you can roll through and see the timeline at which things are going to happen or predicted to happen and you can see that with your wind, the direction of your wind, how that direction might change um, if the wind's decreasing and then you can see that with sky cover, uh, precipitation potential, things like that. Um, I find this very helpful when I'm timing uh, days out in the mountains, um, even in the spring when I'm looking for thunderstorms and stuff like that in the summer. Um, and you can also see, you know, kind of the snowfall that's predicted here. So those are both useful tools. Um, the weather's tough because, you know, they get it wrong a lot. But one of the sites I like because they do get it wrong, wrong a lot is uh, it's called Medio Blue, and they actually make an app for this as well. 
And what they've done with Media Blue is they take like three or four or even five of these big weather models um, that people have in Europe, North American weather models. They combine them and they smash them all together in these computer programs. And then they come out with a bunch of different percentages. And it seems to be a little more accurate, especially in the long term stuff. Um, I'll use this 14 day weather here. Um, which sometimes it's really hard to make a plan for like a trip if you're traveling, you go skiing somewhere um, based on weather. And this one actually gives you a pretty good long terms and it shows you how it blends the different um, the, the, the different weather models together and then the percentage of, and then how accurate they feel about their prediction. So you have the prediction and how accurate they feel. And, a lot of times it's pretty hard to, to, to get it right this far out, but you know, they have a pretty high predictability here, like 65%. Um, so that's Medio Blue, um, really handy, especially if you're traveling abroad, uh, if we ever get to do that again, uh, to Canada, Europe, things like that, um, pretty helpful. So these are all things I'm just looking at in the morning, making my plans for the day or the night before. So you wanna gather all that information about the weather, what's happened, what's going to be happening or predicted to be happening. You can see that with these sensors. Um, you can see the wind. There's wind sensors all over your region, um, whether you're in the Bridgers or in Big Sky or, or wherever. Um, then I'm going to take that and I'm going to look at my avalanche problems, right? And so if you read through the forecast, they should give you a list of what your avalanche problems are for the day. And so you need to take those avalanche problems and look at them critically and be like, okay, well, what kind of terrain should I be in with this sort of avalanche problem? So we're going to go through these real briefly. A lot of you are probably familiar with them, but it's good reminders getting into the season um, for a warm up here. Um, so you've got your persistent weak layers. And I think it's really important, especially folks that are out there that are coming from a maritime snowpack. Let's say you're coming from California or Washington or Oregon. Um, in the Rockies, we live with persistent weak layers. It's just a way of life around here. And the problem with persistent weak layers is they're not like a lot of avalanche problems in the sense where like they're here one day and in 48 hours they're gone. Persistent weak layer can be here for like an entire season. So you could have a persistent weak layer that started, you know, buried fast its depth or whatever in uh, November that still persists until uh, April. And you have to pick your terrain appropriately based on knowing that's there. In Colorado, they've gotten used to this. They've had a, a continental snowpack and they know that a lot of times you just don't ski steeper train until the spring. We get a mixed bag of seasons, but some years we're dealing with a persistent uh, weak layer throughout the season, sometimes multiple for several months at a time. So it's important for you guys to understand that persistent weak layers, they don't go away overnight. They're gonna be there for a while. And most of these accidents we see happening midwinter are people not being patient enough for getting into terrain when persistent weak layers exist. The Avalanche Center puts a lot of thought into when they stop talking about these persistent weak layer problems. It's hard to write them off because the, you write them off and then they bite you in the butt. And so you gotta be really patient and make sure that they're gone uh, before you write them off. Um, but then you got like wind slabs and that's gonna be formed you know, with transported wind, snow from wind, usually ridge lines or cross-loaded gullies mid slope. Um, but with these things, they're going to, you know, give you that like chalky like appearance, a hollow site feel underneath your feet. But the problem with wind slabs is they can break above you. So if you're walking through a wind slab or skiing through a wind slab, you might think you're not going to trigger it, but because you're not above it, but it'll trick, it can trigger above you, even if you're like below the wind slab. Um, the nice thing about wind slabs is they do in fact heal relatively quickly. So if it does stop being windy and stop loading, usually you can get a wind slab to heal within 30, 24 to 48 hours. So that's what we call a, a direct action problem or short term problem, avalanche problem. Uh, deep slabs, those are basically persistent slabs. Same problems. You've got weak layers, persistent weak layers. You've got facets, uh, service hoar, depth hoar buried in the snow. And what we use for the deep slab is that it is buried a meter deep or three feet deep is a rough number. So the reason we use that number is because skiers and snowboarders, as a matter of fact, snowmobilers, if they're just driving over stuff, they spread the weight out enough to where you're not really affecting any snow um, beneath your beneath three feet. So if you have a weak layer that's four feet deep, the odds are you're not going to trigger that. You might be able to ski right over it and never affect it. 
The problem is with spatial variability, you just never know how deep that stuff is because it could be, you know, one foot here and four foot over here. And if you find that sweet spot, you can trigger it. So with deep slabs, the reason they classify them differently is they're just going to be a lot harder to trigger. So, but when you do trigger them, very large avalanches and high consequence. So remember your persistent slabs and your deep slabs are essentially the same thing. One's just deeper and harder to trigger, but it's a bigger mess when you do. Other problems we're looking at, storm snow. That's going to be snow that falls, you know, in the last 24 hours. Um, and it's going to be stuff that you're going to see avalanche failures on steeper terrain, steeper than 35 degrees. It's short-lived, you know. Normally, storm snow, snow, as long as it's not falling on a persistent weak layer, is, uh, is, is, is going to be falling and it's going to be bonding. And if you live in a maritime snowpack like where I grew up, uh, Sierras or Cascades, um, you can pretty much rest assured the way that people usually play the games out there is you say you wait 24 to 48 hours and then you can ski it and it'll be fine. And by and large, that is pretty true, but you got to be careful because you can get caught off guard when it does get a weak layer buried underneath it. Um, you got your loose snow, which is your slough. Slough's not usually going to bury a person, but it can carry you into terrain traps, trees, cliffs. It can hurt you. Um, it's the stuff that you might see in the movies with everyone riding the steep AK lines. They're usually getting chased by slough and just kind of like you know, zigging and zagging to avoid it. Wet slabs, um, something we don't see a ton of in midwinter around here, although it's, we have had a few seasons where they come midwinter, more in the springtime. And it's basically where you get water percolating through the snowpack and it affects a weak layer that's been healed or more or less uh, been non-reactive and it can actually undermine it and then you get like a whole season snowpack to to peel out it's fair they're usually a lot of damage that um, come from them um, but they're also not all that common and they're a little i wouldn't say easier to predict but you can just rest assured like if it's not freezing for multiple days in a row there's probably something going on bad in the snowpack that might cause that wet slab um, loose wet um, that's something we're dealing with in the spring, and I alluded to that earlier. If you're looking at your temperatures, it's super important. If you're going to go out spring skiing, make sure it froze at night or got close. A lot of times, you know, it'll say 35, 38 degrees on the snow tail site, and you get there with the wind chill and stuff. It's gotten cold enough to freeze everything up. But you're looking for the loose wet. If the solar slopes are going to get first, right, east then south and west and north. So you want to time your ski objectives for the day appropriately. If you're going to ski in east face in the spring in Montana, you better be on that slope when the sun comes up. Because you know what, within like an hour, it's probably going to be too wet in the springtime. Whereas if you go around the horn towards the south and the west, it buys you a little more time. Um, Cornus falls, normally like cornice season, it's usually like, you know, after a big year, February, March, the cornices have got huge and they start to fail. They're just too big and overcome, oh, 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 they're overhanging. Um, they're not really something that's all that predictable, but they definitely correlate. Usually when you see one, you're going to see more. Uh, cornices, my recommendation for folks is to just stay away from them. Ski, ski patrollers spend a lot of time like at Bridge or Bowl managing these things. Um, they can because they're small and they're doing them they, they're relatively small. They're doing them every day. And so they keep them that size. If you try to get a season's worth of cornice to fall, it's dangerous. Uh, it can peel out behind you. They have these cornice cutting tools. They're dangerous. I've seen a lot of people have close calls with them. Um, and also a couple of things to consider is if you're dropping cornices on a slope to check stability, which you can do, uh, a lot of times you just destroy the ski quality and there's nothing left good to ski when you're done anyhow. So I just try to avoid the cornice program altogether. If they're starting to look big and nasty, just don't stand underneath them very long. Uh, make your time there very short. Glide avalanches, it's a springtime thing. You see it in Alaska, northern Montana a fair bit. We don't see it here so much. It's when you have a bed surface that gets lubricated, a lot of times granite or grass, and you get the snow to creep, but it's like slowly creeps downhill and it doesn't actually avalanche all at once. Um, but then it eventually, a lot of times it will go all the way oh, and sometimes it won't at all. Um, but just avoid, if you'll see them, they're big glide cracks uh, and when you see that stuff. So the, air, the avalanche scale, North American avalanche scale, I think a lot of people look at these and they low, moderate, considerable high and extreme and they just kind of, okay, that's, I, well, that's moderate today, that's considerable. I think you guys owe yourselves 
uh, a few minutes just at some point to, to read the travel advice and the likelihood of the avalanches. Um, just to have a better understanding of like what the, when the avalanche forecasters say it's considerable today, what does that mean? I try to simplify things for folks out there. And one of the things that I've tried to, that I do and we do here as a guiding company and I try to get my friends to do as well is if you just remember, like you want to simplify your life, if you have low or moderate uh, hazards, that's a good time to go poke into some bigger terrain, but you still have a lot of evaluating to do. Once you hit that considerable mark, it's really a considerable or higher, you shouldn't be in avalanche terrain. And I'll talk a little bit more about what is avalanche terrain in a moment. But once you're at considerable, I think it's important if you read this, it reads natural, av natural avalanche is possible. Human triggered avalanche is likely. I don't like the odds. So if I'm likely to trigger an avalanche, I don't really think I want to be in avalanche terrain that day. So we have a pretty pretty much a rule that we're not going to be skiing steeper slopes on considerable days. And so if you want to just wake up in the morning and make your decision making process easier and with your friends, there's not a lot to argue about. If you if the Avalanche Center says it's considerable today, you better find some 30 degree slopes or less to ski. Because once you start skiing steeper ones, you're starting to tickle the bear, right? People get away with it all the time. And you get away with it until you don't. And it's a numbers game. All this stuff's a big numbers game. So if you want to have a long time, a long career out there, skiing in the mountains, enjoying with friends, and not be stressed, just take considerable days off the radar. If you're, it's considerable, you want to just keep your slope angles down. That being said, we guide and ski in considerable and high avalanche danger quite often around here in southwest Montana, especially Cook City. If we didn't, we wouldn't go skiing. But what we do is we manage our terrain. And I'll show you guys here in a minute some ways that we, some tools we use to help manage that terrain. Um, but it's important to recognize um, when it's time to, to, to turn it back. So terrain, uh, I think if you're not familiar with this, your slope angle wheelhouse for terrain is, for avalanches is 30 to 45 degrees. So in that zone, you're gonna have, the, that's where you're gonna see your avalanches for the most part. Now people, want to know, well, why don't you see them at like 50 degrees? Well, we do see them at 50 degrees, but at that steep, they tend to flush themselves out. They don't hold persistent weak layers. So you get a lot of loose snow avalanches. You get a lot of storm snow, sloughs, and they kind of always clean themselves out. So what's left, you want to wait, you know, 24 to 48 hours after a storm, storm cycle, but 50 degree terrain, you're not usually looking at avalanche problems other than wet, loose, and loose snow avalanches, persistent weak layers don't hang out there. But 38 degrees is kind of our premium 38, 39 uh, avalanche terrain. So like Saddle Peak in Bozeman is like that 38 degree zone. So it's, uh, it's definitely like right at the premium avalanche angle. So it's important to know angles. I'd recommend buying an inclinometer if you don't own one and start to guess with your friends. And they're really inexpensive. A matter of fact, the Avalanche Center does a bunch of classes around the Bozeman region in Southwest Montana. And I think they're giving them away. They were last year, little inclinometers just carry in your pocket. Um, and then you can start getting an idea without using your inclinometer of what slow steepness is. So you can play a game with your friends and have them bet uh, how steep something is. I'll show you some other ways that you can figure that out, but there's nothing better than being like looking at a slope and putting a slope inclinometer on it. These smartphones have inclinometers on them now too, so you can do that. Um, but understanding aspect, because some avalanche problems are going to be specific to aspects. Um, so you got to have a compass. You got to know which way is north, south, east, and west. And sometimes you'll have, you know, a problem that's specific only to north slopes or specific only to east slopes. And so you want to make sure you understand that and pick your terrain accordingly. Um, shape, uh, understanding that a convexity is like where you're going to see a lot of avalanches triggered. And that's where you have a roll in the, the terrain. There's a lot of stress on that snowpack on that roll. And so typically when you see avalanche triggered, a lot of time that's where it gets, it, it, you have the crown where it gets triggered is right in those convexities. Um, concavities, that's going to be a dish, right? So if you're standing in a concave area below a lot of snow, it's a way, it's a place for a lot of snow to fill up. And then lastly, terrain traps. And I can't tell you enough, like the older I get and the more time I spend out there, how important it is to recognize terrain traps and pick your terrain accordingly. 
trees, cliffs, um, like creek bottoms, concavities, those are all terrain traps. And you gotta think about it like this, like you can use all the tools in the world that we're talking about tonight and other ones in the Avalanche Center and you're like a 99.9% .9 sure that you're making the right decision out there. If you are wrong, you just got to think about it, right? If you're wrong, well, you're, you got a beacon on. You better have a beacon on. Your buddies better have shovels and probes and beacons. So if you're wrong, they can dig out, right? A lot of times if it's not too, if you're not buried too deep. But what we're seeing is a lot of people that are dying in avalanches around the, the world, it's not so much the burials that are killing people as the, the trauma. So you're going through trees, off cliffs, in the rocks, things like that. So look at the terrain you're about to ski and think about the consequences and, and pick your terrain accordingly. I like to pick lower consequence terrain the older I get because I know if I mess up, I'm human, right? I can make a mistake. At least I have a fighting chance. And just kind of a couple examples of that is we have like your classic avalanche path here with the start zone, a track, a deposition zone. Um, if you look at this picture here, this is Canada. If you take away the crevasse issues, this is really low consequence terrain. This is like 30 degree, just super fun powder. Um, you're not gonna get an avalanche in this terrain. It's like super low angle. And if you think about getting an avalanche, in an avalanche and like this wide open stuff towards the bottom of the run, you're gonna be probably like, you know, buried in a spot that's, that's open and you're, you, hopefully your buddies can dig out. But if that's something that looks like this, this sort of terrain scares me. I don't like skiing this sort of terrain. And so this terrain, all these little trees that you're seeing there, it's because it gets avalanched all the time. And there's little trees within the big pocket of big trees in the middle of that picture. That means that avalanches happen within those trees. And that's high consequence terrain. If you get caught in a little avalanche, it could just be a six inch slab. You're gonna be pinballed through those trees and it's the trauma that's gonna kill or hurt you. So think about terrain when you're skiing this stuff because the consequences of skiing that terrain that we're looking at right now are much larger than something wide open with a nice runout zone. Trees are a misnomer for those of you that think skiing in trees uh, is, is safer. It's, it's not in fact true. Um, and so I think what people need to understand is lots of accidents, slab avalanches happen in trees. And if trees are spaced well enough to have like fun skiing to where you're like making groovy turns and you know zipping around and uh, doing your slarve and all that stuff it's probably wide enough it's gonna it could create you could have an avalanche in there um if it's so tight like a vermont like back east like michigan site type trees where they're like stacked up where you just have to kind of barely wiggle through them yeah there's some anchoring there that's gonna affect not having an avalanche but you can think like most of the trees you're going to go skiing in the bridgers. You know, if you go ski off a bridger peak or a lot of this stuff off a saddle, I mean, if you've got, if trees around you, all they are is hazards. So don't get too comfortable with the tree program. Um, they're just something to hurt you if you end up falling or going for a ride. Just a little example here, terrain, uh, thinking about it when you're out there. Bridger is a good one to use because most people are familiar with it, but that line draws the boundary there. Um, and uh, Saddle Peak is, oh, mo for the most part, been pretty forgiving to the community of Bozeman. And I've seen a lot of avalanches there and I've been involved in some searches there before. The terrain there is like super steep, it's like 38 to 40 degrees. It's awesome skiing. When I was younger, we used to ski there and the lifts didn't allow you to come up Slushman's and hike out of bounds. For us to go ski Saddle Peak was a pretty big deal. It was a big day. It was like a lot of commitment. We knew we were doing something that was kind of big, you know. I don't know that you're really, today because of the human factors involved in the ease of access, I'm not sure that everyone puts it together how really it's quite a, it's quite a um, impressive ski run. And I think people take it around how it's, it's kind of just normal for folks to ski it. Something to consider about it is you just need a small avalanche on the football field here to go over huge cliffs. Same with Saddle Peak. So, you know, like it's not going to be maybe you triggering an avalanche, but it could be the person above you triggering that avalanche and then you get swept over. Um, that's just unforgiving terrain. And um, it's hard to manage because of uh, all the people that are around. But when it's good, it's as good as it gets. So you got to pick your time right wisely and be looking at the wind, the amount of new snow, the avalanche forecast. Don't forget, it is out of bounds. And so 
ski it when the Avalanche Center says, it hasn't been windy last night. There hasn't been a lot of new snow. We got green light conditions. It's probably a good time to go out there, but gosh, you know, if they're forecasting considerable avalanche danger, it's definitely not a place I'd want to be. You know, there's lots of good terrain. It's lower angle that you can have fun, what I call old man powder turns. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, there's a time to be in the steeper stuff, and I love that too. Um, so one of the ways that you can help learn about uh, managing the terrain is there's some great map tools out there. So the great thing is about the Internet is it's kind of leveled the playing field, right? Everyone has access to this stuff. Um, I use – there's some phone apps I'll talk about in a minute. You can use CalTopo is one of the many, but I think it's the best like online source for creating maps and such for yourself and checking out. So pretty much anytime I'm going into uncharted territories or going to a place I'm not as familiar with, I'm always on CalTopo the day before or the morning of to get a game plan. And so CalTopo actually has a phone app they just came out with. And I've heard it's okay. I haven't tried it yet. But if you go to your CalTopo site, if you're not familiar with it, definitely check it out. Hey, but man. It's mad. I got to yeah. jump in really quick. If you go down to share the screen share and go to web browser, people can actually see what you're looking at on the internet. Otherwise, they're just seeing the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. So where do, you, where so do we want to be brief now? Yeah, the screen share button in the bottom that you clicked on before that you could click on your presentation. If yeah, you click on that screen again, it should say you should have an option of your web browser. Okay. Uh, oh, I see. I got to do them individually. Yep. Okay, there's Cal Topo. So I'll remember to do that on the next one. Yeah, How's that? Yeah, sorry to jump in, but let's see. No, thank you. Everyone got that then, Matt? Is that right? Yeah, that's up there now. Cool. Awesome. Okay, cool. So we're on uh, caltopo.com now. And um, Great tool. Uh, so I just use Mount Blackmore as an example for y'all. Um, and so you can you can type in, you can search engine kind of wherever you want um, to fig to get you know where you're going. You can put in Cook City to get a baseline and kind of you know move the map around with your mouse to to see what's going on. Um, some of the things that I use this for. Um, Why well, I build maps, and I'll show you how to do that. That I can put a route on, download a GPX, and then simply just uh, upload it to my phone, to my map on my phone, and then I have a map on my phone that has the route on and everything for me to follow. Um, with this, uh, one of the things that I, I, my favorite tool about this, and I think that it's important to preface this if you are in fact going to use this, it's the slope shading tool, is it's not 100%. You can't turn your brain off, right? You got to like still break out the anconometer and use your common sense. But if you're taking here and looking at the um, CalTopo, um, the slope shading, um, you can look here on the right side of the screen, and 27 to 29, the yellow is going to is, is is like it's below avalanche, not avalanche terrain. So anything white is not avalanche terrain. Um, 30 to 31, you're still kind of not really in too much avalanche terrain. We don't see a lot of avalanches there at that light kind of yellowish orange. And then 32 to 34, you're definitely getting an avalanche train. And then the 35 to 45, uh, you're in the wheelhouse. So it's a really cool tool. So you can see what you're traveling under and around uh, when you're picking ski um, ski, ski um, options for the day. Uh, you can use this tool and um, be like, well, I want to keep it under 30 degrees today. What's 30 degrees? Okay, well, let's look on this map tool. Uh, and so a really common route folks use to go up to Mount Blackmore is this shoulder here and then up the ridge. There's obviously other ways too, but it's a really nice way to approach. Um, you're kind of staying out of avalanche terrain there, but as soon as you zip over here, you know, you can see um, there's uh, towards the, you know, southeast there's or southwest, there's a, definitely a lot of avalanche terrain. And the iconic north face of Blackmore, I mean, it's right there in the purple, reds and purples. So it's you know, 40 to 50 degrees, um, somewhere in there. So it gives you some ideas of the slope shading. Um, you, like I said, it's a great tool um, to get an idea of where you can go. And I think it's also a great tool because a lot of people don't understand about connected terrain. 
if you are on 30 degree slope, but it's attached to a steep of 40 degree terrain slope above it, you're in fact in 40 degree terrain. So in other words, if you look at the run out here of Mount Blackhorn North Face, this whole basin is white, so it's not avalanche terrain. So you might think that you're safe right here, but in fact, it's attached to this. You could collapse a weak layer down in this basin that might subsequently trigger an avalanche up high and come down and bury you. So that's really important stuff to know it's above you. And especially when you're in like whiteout conditions and you're not familiar with the terrain and you don't know what's above you, a map tool with a, with a slope shading can be really helpful. Um, so like if you have a Gaia program, which I'll show you in a second on my phone, you can actually click a button on there while you're standing there and it'll tell you like what's above you in slope as, as far as slope uh, steepness. Um, so that's a really good tool. And then another thing you can do with this is you can use it to make a route so that, and you can download that route, or maybe you're just curious, is my friend sandbagging me? Are they going to make me walk seven miles tomorrow? How far is it actually to where I want to go? And you can use, um, this line right here on add, and then you can come across and let, we can just go down to the trailhead here and you can make your own route. So I'll come in and, um, Let's see here. We'll just kind of click along. Ooh, let me go there. I don't want to go there. There we go. We'll just make a straight line. Ah, I did it. Let me get rid of that real quick. Try that over. Funny. Yeah, it likes that trailhead. So we'll start a little closer so it doesn't pick up all that. And then we're going to run up here and then down. You can just click along. And up the valley towards Mount Blackmore. There's always that nice spot where you have to lose elevation. That one always makes me mad. And then you come up and around. You're up to the ridge and then up to the summit of Mount Blackmore. So I have a line drawn there, which is really cool is now I can take this line, I can click it, and I can check out my profile. And it shows me, okay, what are they, how far is it? It's, uh, that's showing 3.61 miles, which I think is a little off, but I think that's, oh, it's because I missed some of these switchbacks at the beginning, because there's all these little whipties. But you've got the distance there. You can kind of see as you go along uh, where you're, how far along you are based on that. 3,472 vertical feet. Um, that's a pretty good climb. So it gives you an idea of, um, of what you're up against for the day. And then if you come over here to uh, export, you can export a, a GPX or KML file, download it to your computer, and then you have a route that you can download to your phone. Um, so anyhow, CalTopo is a really good tool for planning your day. And it's really great for seeing what's going on with your slope steepness before you go out. And they're like, man, I got to find some lower angle stuff to ski today. What would be some good options? Um, but like I said, there's, there's, you got to, can't turn your brain off. You still got to, um, you know, check things for yourselves. Um, so that is CalTopo. Then there's the Gaia, um, and I'll just click on here, the website. I only use the website to download my stuff, and I have an account, and uh, you log in. You can actually just download the map, and what's really cool is it's synced to my phone program app, and as soon as I download it to my Gaia, um, it automatically uploads to my phone, and then when I go out in the mountains for the day, you don't need cell phone service. It works off of GPS. Um, it's, uh, it works anywhere you have the maps downloaded. So just make sure you have the map downloaded for the area you're going to be. But, you know, there's so many good programs out there now. I mean, I've been happy with Gaia, but CalTopo is a good one. The Onyx is great. I find it not as good for the skiing stuff, but some people, I think it's whatever you get used to. Um, there's View Ranger and some other stuff. But I tell you what, if you're going hiking at all in Montana or just, you know, whatever, even boating, you should have some sort of GPS system because it's super helpful and keeps you from getting lost. Um, and Gaia costs a little bit of money, but 
it works in Europe, it works in Canada, it works all over the world. So wherever you're going to go ski, you can download that map. If you're going to some remote range in Montana that you've never skied before, you can download your map and, um, and then you'll have it there. Um, so that's a good way to go. So just uh, kind of wind, to wind down the talk with just a few more things we're going to look at when we go out in the mountains. We can see this on the sensors when we're looking there on the websites in the morning. We can see it for ourselves when we're walking around the mountains. Um, and so we have what we call red flags or bullseye data. And uh, this stuff's like you cannot ignore this if you're out in the mountains. It's simple and it's like if you're seeing like multiple of these things, like three of these things going on at once in one day, if you're going to be an avalanche train that day, you're probably going to cause an avalanche. So think about like lots of wind loading, right? Wind loading can transport, like let's say it's, it snows three or four inches of snow at Bridger Bowl. Um, you know, with wind loading coming from the west, that east side might have 10 or 12 inches of snow. So the wind is a huge player for loading events. Think about that. What direction is it coming from? When you see it coming off the ridges, those are all red flags. Um, significant snow. That's also a loading event. So it's a picture of the Oh, yeah. Don't forget to share your PowerPoint again. Oh, that's not shared. No. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Let me get uh, back. Oops. So I was completely justified to be scared of technology for this presentation, apparently. Totally. <laughs> uh, let's go back to that. Tab. We have my, there it is. All right, you guys got that now, Matt? You see yeah, that all right? Yeah, yep, you're good. Cool. All right, so you got your significant snow, like, you know, we're talking about an inch of sweet overnight or 24 hours. That's a significant load on the snowpack. Um, these are red flags. Uh, the number one red flag we have out there, indicator of instable, inst instabilities, is recent avalanche activity. So if you're walking around the mountains and the avalanche center said it was pretty darn safe out there and you thought it was pretty safe when you were going out in the morning and you're feeling really good about things and all of a sudden you walk up and there's a brand new avalanche on the east facing slope and you were planning on skiing a different east facing slope, you probably ought to rethink your plan for the day. So that recent avalanche activity, it definitely is the most important thing you're going to see out there. So sharing that information with the avalanche center, your friends and peers is super important. Um, the rapid rise in temperatures, it's not as much of a player midwinter, but if you have it in the spring, especially you can get wet avalanches or loose, um, you can get snow moving that gets too wet. And then cracking, collapsing, or what we call woomphing. A lot of you probably uh, felt that before where the, the snowpack actually collapses underneath you. You feel it um, or you hear it um, cracking uh, at your skis. Um, all these things are red flags. So. To heed their warnings, don't ignore them. Even if you, it's everyone said it was safe out that day and it was a low avalanche danger, things can change quickly. And if you're getting these things going on, like a couple, three of them, it's definitely a big deal. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about, and like I think the simplifying things in the backcountry, the hardest thing to simplify is the humans. Humans are very complex creatures, and we're very good at like talking ourselves into doing stupid things. Um, and so I think like making sure that you have clear communication, you're flexible to change your plan. Um, you know, one of the things I haven't really touched base on is like snow science and digging pits. And if you're going out, um, I always recommend putting a shovel in the ground, learning how to do a compression test, an extended column test. These things are great for gathering information and understanding how the snowpack is transitioning. One of the human factors that people fall into is you can't, you don't, in Montana, some places people say you shouldn't dig snow pits because they think it's too complex of information for recreational folks to digest and make decisions based on. 
But the truth of the matter is, if you live in Montana or Wyoming, the forecast areas only cover so much ground. So if you're skiing in areas like Cody and Red Lodge and Helena and Great Falls, you don't have an avalanche center. So you better put a shovel on the ground and figure out what's going on. But you got to use all these other things we talked about, the recent weather conditions, the red flags. And then, you know, if you're feeling really good about stuff and like, man, it's feeling good. I haven't seen natural avalanches. It's it's low avalanche danger. I'm going to ski this 40 degree slope. Super excited. Before you ski that slope, find a slope of similar elevation, similar aspect and do a snow pit. And if you do a snow pit and you do an ECT and you get an ECT X, um, which is, you know, a result where nothing happens, um, you basically can feel really good about your decision. You know, you're like, man, I, I made a great decision. I'm going to, this is going to be super fun. But it's like, you, you, if you were to get a propagating result on an ECT, you probably ought to rethink what you're doing that day because there's something going on there that is not aligning with everything else that you saw. And then on the flip side, what we're seeing with the human factor is you don't want to ever use a snow pit to be like, hey, it's been snowing. We still got an inch of sweet last night. It's been windy. And the avalanche center says it's considerable danger. I dug a snow pit and it's like bomber. I got ECTX, really good results. Like I'm going to ski this thing, even though I have like, because they, you know, because I have a good snow pit. Like you never want to use a snow pit to turn on terrain but you definitely want to use it to turn off terrain. So that's just a human factor discussion I like to have with folks. Um, and out, there's a couple acronyms out there we use in the industry for human factor. And there's this guy named Ian McGammon, and he came up with these two, is Altruth and Facets, many years ago now, maybe 20 years ago. And basically he studied like 350 plus avalanche accidents. And he was a friend of his died in an avalanche that was an expert and he didn't understand why he made the decisions he made knowing what he did so he went through and he researched all these avalanches and he found these common human factor mistakes and so i think it's really important for us to recognize that we're human we need to listen to our gut instincts we need to talk to people our partners and have respect for our partners and <clears throat> some of these things like alp truth i'll just go through them real quick they're kind of like the red flags with Alp Truth, okay, if you've got recent avalanche activity in the last 24 hours, um, if you've got loading events, lots of wind or snow in the last 24 hours, if you've got um, uh, known, av if you're in a known avalanche path, right? Like if you're in an avalanche, something that's avalanche before, um, if you're around gullies, trees, cliffs, or other terrain features, terrain traps that might make an avalanche more severe, cause bodily harm. Um, is it considerable or higher avalanche danger out there? Um, are you getting that collapsing, cracking of the snowpack we talked about, another red flag? Or, or do you have that, uh, like a rapid thawing of the, of the snowpack? And what he found out, based on all of the altruists, if you have three of these things going on at once during the day, the number actually I've heard a little bit higher, like 92 to 95 percent of accidents all have like three of these things going on. So if you're out in the mountains and you have three of these things going on, it doesn't mean you can't be out in the mountains having a good time. You just want to stay out of avalanche terrain. You want to keep your slope angles at that 30 degrees. You want to like maintain that you're not in connected terrain to larger terrain. Know what's above you. If you can't see, you can use these uh, route planning tools like Gaia and Calitopo to see, you know, what's above you based on the slope shading. You can use your implementometer, things like that. So the Altruth acronym comes in that way. It's basically a red flag. But if you've got three of these things going on, you better start thinking about your decision making process. And then the last one is heuristics. And this one, I think, is the most interesting to me. And ironically, I think it's come into play a lot more with scientists in the recent last 10 years, especially like in Bozeman, they're doing a lot of research on just human factor stuff because what we're realizing is, even though we have all these really smart people and we have all this knowledge about snowpack and we have all these tests, ECTs, it, to some degree, and they have an avalanche centers telling people when it's safe and not safe, we have all this information, people are still making poor decisions. Well, why are they making these poor decisions? Well, one of them might be familiarity. That's the first in, in facets. And you're familiar with the terrain. Uh, you ski it all the time. 
a guide like me, I ski the same terrain quite a bit. I can fall into this pretty easily where I get comfortable skiing the same thing and I kind of think I know what I'm doing. And the same thing with stuff that you're skiing out there, or whatever you're doing, if it's steep enough to slide, it will slide. If you haven't seen it slide, that doesn't mean anything. It just means you haven't seen it slide. But if it's 35 degrees, it can slide. So being familiar with slopes and thinking they don't slide or do slide, it's take that part of it out, out of it for you. Just like critically look at the slope you're going to ski every time you ski it. If it's steep enough, it can slide. If it has instabilities within that snow, it can slide. Um, acceptance. You know, I think the acceptance thing is a huge one for folks. And I think a lot of these accidents over the years, they end up talking to people involved in accidents after the fact. And by and large, most accidents that happen, they'll talk to other people that were part of that group and they'll hear the same thing. They'll be like, well, we weren't sure it was a good idea, but we didn't want to say anything to ruin everyone's day. And so you have this acceptance things like you don't want to ruin people's days. So you don't say anything. It's like, just speak up. And even if it's like, you don't really have a good reason other than you don't feel good about it. There's something to be said about intuition, I think. And, um, you know, if you have good friends, good partners, they're going to be accepting of you. If you make the decision to pull a plug on something, if they're, they're not, and they give you a hard time, you probably want to find different ski partners, uh, consistency or commitment. Um, that that's a, a huge one. Um, it's just like you put a lot of effort into getting there. You traveled across the world to go skiing. You're never going to go back there. You might end up pushing the envelope a little bit more. Um, you end up like hiking like 10 miles, to some remote mountain in Montana to ski it, camp overnight. Um, there's a lot of commitment in that. It might make you push it a little bit further um, than you might normally. So that commitment, it, it can be an issue. The expert halo thing, I'll tell you, everyone thinks they're expert, experts out there. And any good expert, if you ask an expert a question or you question what their decision is, they should, if they're a good expert, they should be okay with that. And they should give you an answer for why uh, they're doing what they're doing. And so don't, just because you're less experienced than the expert in the group, you should be able to ask them questions and be part of that decision-making process. Um, I always tell my clients when I go out skiing with them, take them out skiing, is if I'm taking you out and you don't feel comfortable uh, or you're worried about something, you should bring it up to me. And if I can't give you a really good answer without hesitation of why we're doing what we're doing, then there's a problem. And uh, any expert you hang out with should be the same way and, and just ask questions, be part of that decision-making process. Um, Tracks or scarcity um, is a really important one and it goes both ways. It goes, there's tracks on the slope already, it must be safe. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It just it means that there's a persistent weak layer there. It just means that someone hasn't found the spot to tickle to trigger it. When Saddle Peak slid six foot slab in like 2011, I watched that whole thing happen and helped put a search on for it. That slope, and Carl Berkland had predicted it, and so did Doug Chabot, that basically like, there was a persistent weak layer buried way back, I think in December or late November under a wind slab. And they're like, this is going to show up later in the year. And it had been skied out a thousand times or more. And no one could penetrate that persistent weak layer, just not enough weight. And it took a big, large cornice to trigger it. And that's what caused that. But the tracks didn't mean anything. You know, they, it's to have the, the weak layer was still there and it still triggered an avalanche. Unfortunately, no one was hurt. The scarcity goes the same way with scarcity. Like who doesn't want the first tracks down the slope, right? Someone else is going to ski it. I know they're going to ski it. I want to be the first, but it, maybe it's not the right time to ski it. So I think something that's really important for folks to realize is in backcountry skiing and snowmobiling, we get a lot of feedback that's really bad because we never know how close we came to tickling the persistent weak layer or causing an avalanche because we ski it. We had a great time. And even though we were like skiing it, maybe on a day we weren't supposed to, or it was like a little bit too much new snow on top of a persistent weak layer, we didn't cause an avalanche. And so we didn't like correlate that we made a bad decision that day. It's like, if you're swinging a hammer working on the house and you smash your finger, you're like, man, that was dumb. Make sure I move my finger out of the way next time. Right? So that's the sort of feedback you get that you can make changes quickly to, but 
when you ski over and over again and never cause an avalanche, it doesn't mean you're making a great decision. It just makes you, it means you're getting away with it a lot of times. Um, so the tracks and the scarcity program. Uh, and then the last one, and I'll just end on this, is the solace facilitation. Um, it's basically, I, I don't, when Ian McGammon wrote this, there was no social media. Um, so I don't think he really thought it would be like it is. But now with everyone knowing what everyone else is doing and talking it up and spraying stuff everywhere, like it's really hard for folks to like make critical thinking choices sometimes. You're like, well, so-and-so just did it. It must be good. And so doing it because your friends thinks it's a good idea or someone else thinks it's a good idea is probably not a good way to go about things. Um, I think, you know, making a critical decision based on the avalanche uh, forecast, the weather, uh, what you're seeing when you put the shovel on the ground to dig a snow pit, that's going to be the proper way to make your decisions when you go out there. Um, so that's the end of my talk. The, 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 the long and skinny of it is, I think I like to just make sure folks understand, like, you don't have to be scared. You can see on high hazard days, you just got to learn terrain. You don't learn terrain overnight, but you can manage terrain correctly and ski low angle powder to your old, have a good time. Um, just use the resources that you have. I mean, they're all free. The Avalanche Center, you got all these no webs, uh, the weather sites, uh, snow tell sites wind sensors, all these things um, to learn from every day you go out. So there's a lot of ways to um, to make critical thinking choices and, you know, up your game, you know, go take a level two or, you know, maybe a professional uh, avalanche course. And, you know, there's always something to learn. And the cool thing about the industry of avalanche education is that it's always changing. And I talk about this all the time, but there's all these smart people working on new ideas all the time and testing things. A lot of that's happening in Bozeman at the, at the university there. Um, and so you can, you haven't taken a class in five years. There's probably some new technology or new science that's, uh, that's changed since you've uh, last taken a class. So I'll go ahead and see if anyone had any questions on anything. Oh, no questions. Looks like I covered all my bases. What do you think, Matt? We got only a few people here. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and jump in and ask them to Ben right now. You must have done a good job, huh? I, I guess you covered everything or everybody fell asleep <laughs> at their computers. Ah. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks, you guys. I, I appreciate you listening to me run my mouth for the last hour. So I actually have a question for you, Ben. Um, what are the things that you usually, in regards to avalanche stuff and kind of knowing what's going on, what's all this, the tools that you usually carry in your pack with you? Avalanche related? Yep. Yeah, so for an avalanche related kit, I'd say like what everyone should be carrying in the mountains if you're going to do a little snow study stuff is you got to, well, you always have a probe no matter what, right? Because you have that in your avalanche rescue kit, but um, you should have a avalanche probe that has like measurements on it. So that's a really good way. Or you can have a, a ruler that makes some nice little flip up rulers you can use, but you want to be able to gather that uh, information, how deep the snowpack is, where the leak layers are located. So some sort of measuring device. You know, I don't know that a recreationalist needs to carry a magnifying glass or a loop, but they can be nice to look at stuff if you want to geek out on things. Um, a snow card, a crystal card is really important um, to check for weak layers, to look at crystal sizes, um, things like that. Uh, a snow saw, I think at bare minimum, like if you're going out in the mountains, I'd say in your snow kit, you're going to have a snow saw. Um, and some, I like snow saws that are multi-use, stuff that you could use to cut a tree if you need to make a fire in a rescue situation. Um, and a, we use a cord for cutting ECTs, like a three millimeter cord that's seven or eight feet long. Um, that comes in handy for cutting your ECTs. Um, other than that, um, on, on the snow science end of things. I mean, there's a multitude of things you can do with thermometers and things like that. And that's just kind of getting more advanced. But I'd say if you've got a crystal card, a snow saw, um, and your cord to cut your uh, ECT uh, shovel and probe, you should be good to go. Awesome, thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool, well, it looks like you must have covered everything. Um, not any more questions going on here. So huge thank you, Ben, for putting this together and for working with us tonight. This was awesome.
Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so this is going to be recorded. We'll have it on our YouTube channel. If anybody couldn't make it tonight or you want to share it with your friends. Also, all those online resources that Ben had, um, apologize we didn't get those up on the screen. Um, but what we'll do is actually, if I can get those resources from you, Ben, I'll actually create like a resource handout. And we'll have that on the Uphill Pursuit stuff too. So if people want to actually go and check out those weather sites and kind of know where they need to go to get that stuff, we'll, uh, we'll kind of put together put all that info together for you guys. Sounds great. I'll get that to you right as soon as we have it. Awesome. Well, with uh, that, that's that's the end of that. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming and tuning in tonight. Um, again, stay tuned. We're going to do a few more of these kind of 101s. Our next one is uh, December 3rd. Um, and, yeah. Uh, oh, there you go. Here's a question for you, Ben. Are the courses on avalanche.org the best place to start for 101 classes on avalanches? Yeah, avalanche.org has some really good videos on it. And so I think that's a really good start. You know, I mean, you can do that right from home. And then the Avalanche Center, the, Mont uh, the Gallup National Forest Avalanche Center offers some great, they're very inexpensive avalanche classes there throughout the winter in Bozeman region and also in Helena and other places. And on their website, they have an education calendar. They're very inexpensive and they're usually like two evenings and one field day. So I'd say between those two, that's a pretty good starting point. Totally. And, and they do those one hour avalanche awareness. They're doing them all by Zoom this year because of the fact that with COVID. And so check out this site because they've got links to all those that are going on. So. Cool. Thanks, you guys. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Stay tuned and uh, get out there and do your snow dance, too. Hopefully winter's coming here pretty soon. We got it in Cook City. We're looking for it. Totally. <laughs> see you guys. We'll see you down in Cook City. Thank you guys for putting this on. Yeah, you're super welcome. Thanks for coming.